Have you ever noticed that some states have a unique feel to them while others are indistinguishable from another? New Hampshire is one of those that stands out. It's in New England, yet it's unlike the other states in the region in so many different ways. Some people go so far as to call it the Texas of the North. So join me, won't you, while I uncover some of the reasons that New Hampshire is a little weird. The state's motto is live free or die. It comes from a quote by New Hampshire resident and Revolutionary War hero John Stark who said, live free or die, death is not the worst of evils. New Hampshireites take the motto literally. If you were over the age of 18, you can purposefully choose not to wear a seatbelt because New Hampshire is the one state that doesn't have a seatbelt law. One might think that there would be an increase in automobile fatalities due to this, but the rate is actually below the national average. The Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, a nonprofit that does research on traffic fatalities, says that the low fatality rate is in part because the state doesn't have large expanses of highway for people to travel. New Hampshire is one of the smallest states, and most of the residents are concentrated in the urban areas of the southern part of the state, so people aren't going as far on roadways. Going hand-in-hand with this, there's also no law concerning helmet use for motorcyclists. In the neighboring state of Maine, a person can walk into a grocery store or pharmacy chain like Rite Aid and buy whatever kind of alcohol they want. Wine, beer, hard liquor, whatever the case may be. But in New Hampshire, you can only get liquor and wine from the liquor store, but not beer. If you want beer, you get that at the grocery store. How does that make any sense? Also, there isn't really an establishment known as a bar in New Hampshire, not like you would see in other states. In the Granite State, there is a requirement the bars also serve food, so they're actually more like restaurants than bars. This goes back to the end of Prohibition, when the state decided that they didn't want bars and saloons popping up randomly, so they made a rule that says liquor licenses are only granted to restaurants. They eventually relax this requirement for places that only serve beer and wine, but if a bar owner wants to serve hard liquor, they are still required to serve food with it. 50% of sales has to come from food if you want a full liquor license. Alternatively, the establishment has to sell at least $75,000 worth of food every year. But live free, right? New Hampshire is one of nine states that doesn't impose an income tax on its residents. It's also one of five states in the country that doesn't have a statewide sales tax. If you go to a border town in New Hampshire, you'll probably see residents from a neighboring state shopping at one of the numerous shopping malls, outlets, and retail stores to take advantage of the lack of sales tax. However, taxes are what support things like roadways, schools, and libraries, so if they don't impose income or state taxes, they have to find that revenue somewhere. So where does the money come from? Local property taxes. New Hampshire has the fourth highest effective property tax in the country at 2.09%, which means that buying a home is more expensive there. The tax structure also means that there are always questions around the things the state doesn't fund to the extent that other states do, including the university system, corrections, and social service programs. Oddly enough, though, the first free tax-supported public library in the United States was established in 1833 in Peterborough, New Hampshire. New Hampshire has the distinction of having the largest elected state body in the U.S., It actually has the third largest elected legislative body in the English-speaking world with its House of Representatives, after the U.S. House and the U.K. House of Commons. It has 400 members, but the state's population is only just a hair under 1.4 million. So if you live there, your representative really could be your neighbor. In addition to that, all state offices are on the ballot every two years, so the elected leaders are pretty much always campaigning, but I don't quite understand why anyone would want the job. Unlike other states, there isn't a patronage or a decent salary attached to service in the state legislature. Legislators only get paid $100 a year for the session. That's not much incentive to throw one's hat into the ring, unless the person has aspirations of a national level. New Hampshire is one of the swingiest of the swing states. For example, in the 2016 presidential election, not even 3,000 votes separated Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, with the final numbers at 47.25% to 47.62% of the vote. But then, in 2020, some of those voters turned on Trump, and Biden won the state with 52.71% to 45.36% of the votes. It's such a swing state that you also see strange things at a more local level. Their governor, Chris Sununu, is a Republican, while their two U.S. senators, Maggie Hassan and Jean Shaheen, are both Democrats. This is because voters don't behave in New Hampshire the way they do in other states. Many of the voters there don't have a problem splitting votes and choosing members of opposing parties for different positions. Part of this is because New Hampshireites have qualities from both parties. Typically, in more rural states made up of older white residents like Iowa, for example, you'll see that they tend to align with the Republican Party. 
New Hampshire is also a deeply fiscally conservative state where endorsing an income tax would make a candidate politically toxic, and there is a strong libertarian streak running through it. But on the other hand, college-educated voters tend to choose Democrats, and New Hampshire is one of the most educated states in the U.S. It's also one of the least religious. Think tanks have found that church attendance is a key predictor of partisanship among white voters. New Hampshire State Representative Ross Berry told Vox in an interview, It is an older, mostly white state that's very rural, but you have all these college-educated voters who are irreligious, and these factors are in conflict with themselves, to explain why New Hampshire is such a swing state. It certainly makes it an interesting place to live. Out of the 13 original colonies, New Hampshire was the first to declare its independence from England. On January 5, 1776, before the colony had entered into any active conflict with the British forces and six months before the Declaration of Independence was signed, New Hampshire's first constitution was ratified. This was later replaced by the Constitution of 1784, which is still active today. The Constitution has a Bill of Rights and guarantees the right to revolution, which was especially important to residents after the Revolutionary War. It set up the system of government to include two houses to address internal and external issues. On June 21, 1788, New Hampshire became the ninth U.S. state after they voted to ratify the newly drafted United States Constitution. The Granite State has a history of women fighting for equality. One of these women was Marilla Ricker, who had set out on a traditional wife's path. However, widowed in her 20s, she became financially independent thanks to her late husband's wealth. This was an unusual position for a woman to be in in the 1860s, when most had to depend on men for their livelihoods, and she tried to use it to gain rights for women. Within a year, she was attending suffrage conventions. The next year, when she was 30, she became the first woman to try to vote in New Hampshire when she attempted to get a ballot in the town of Dover. As expected, the town clerk denied her request, and Ricker stated, No honest man doing a legitimate business need fear a woman's vote, but some men scare easily. In 1897, she applied for a position as ambassador to Columbia, and in 1910, she applied to run for governor of New Hampshire. She didn't expect to get either. Her aim was to cut a path for other women to come after her. She said, whether I secure the appointment or not, I have established a precedent in asking for it. There is no gender in brain, and it is time to do away with the silly notion that there is. Ricker lived to be 80, dying on November 12, 1920, which was fortunately long enough for her to see women gain the right to vote on August 18, 1920. New Hampshire was also the site of the first women's strike in the history of the United States, also in the town of Dover. Mill workers made history in 1828 when they went on strike to protest against unfair wages and unbearable conditions. The women worked at a textile mill in unfavorable conditions and paid low wages. However, the management was considered relatively fair and good to them for the time. But then in 1828, the mill changed hands, with the new owners deciding that they could cut costs by reducing the women's wages while leaving male wages unchanged. The women naturally decided that this was unfair and went on strike for better wages and working conditions. Unfortunately, the strike was short-lived. The mill owner immediately placed an advertisement in the local newspaper searching for their replacements. The women, fearing the loss of their jobs and with no other recourse, returned to their roles at the newly reduced wages. Although they didn't succeed, this was still a step forward in the discussion of wage parity. When you think aliens, the town of Roswell, New Mexico might come to mind. But did you know that the first alien abduction reported in the United States occurred in New Hampshire? On September 19, 1961, newlyweds Barney and Betty Hill were driving home from their honeymoon in Montreal. As they drove through New Hampshire's White Mountains, they said they were being followed by what felt like a spotlight. So they pulled over, and they saw an alien spaceship floating above their car. They were enveloped by this light from the ship, and then they blacked out. When they regained consciousness, they were in their car miles down the road, and they couldn't remember the previous two hours. When they arrived home, they discovered mysterious marks on their car. The zipper on Betty's dress was torn and stained, and the strap on Barney's binoculars was also broken. Of course, they realized that if they told anyone, it would sound like they lost their minds, so they kept their story under wraps for a while. But then they began experiencing nightmares and anxiety, so they turned to hypnosis to see whether there were suppressed memories of the event, and it seemed that there were. The hypnotist recorded a session in which Betty and Barney recall boarding a saucer-like aircraft and being taken into separate rooms to be physically evaluated. The recordings were eerie, as Betty was terrified by the creatures and experience. A Boston reporter picked up the couple's story, and as expected, readers went crazy to learn more. The Hills ended up having to go public with their story to try to regain control of the narrative after being thrust into the limelight by the reporter. So, did aliens visit New Hampshire? Who knows? Your guess is as good as mine, but the story certainly makes the case that New Hampshire is different from many other states. 
would you consider moving to New Hampshire or is it just too weird a state for you? It's in my top five states that I'm considering moving to when I become an empty nester. I've always felt like I should live in a state with mountains. I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, give it a thumbs up and consider supporting the channel through merch, a membership, Patreon subscription, or a tip through the links in the description. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, I remain stuck in the current field.